Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Rand Akashe. I am from the University of Illinois at Chicago. I study basically how diseases occur. It's a field we call pathophysiology. And I'm going to discuss the role of insulin in uh, today's most prevalent chronic diseases. Uh, the title is the role of hyperinsulinemia, meaning increased insulin levels in the circulation and how they are related to chronic diseases. What's insulin anyway? To start with the basics, this hormone is secreted by uh, the pancreas, uh, this organ that sits uh, kind of uh, uh, lower to the uh, stomach, and it's a peptide hormone. It's produced by the cleavage of a longer peptide and goes to the circulation, and it has a very complicated and various functions that are conveyed through signaling pathway. This is what happens inside our cells. And this is rather a simplified version of it. But what insulin does is that it binds to a receptor, as we see here, and then it triggers a cascade of biochemical reactions, which classically would lead to the transportation of the glucose channel to the cell membrane so glucose can get inside the cell. In addition to that, insulin is known to be an anabolic hormone, so it stops lipolysis or lipid uh, release, fatty acid release, uh, it stops proteolysis, it triggers fatty acid synthesis, the accumulation of fat in the adipose tissue, uh, the production of lipids in the liver and their export, uh, glycogen synthesis in the muscle, in the liver. Uh, it also blocks gluconeogenesis, which is the production of glucose in the liver, and ketogenesis. So it's basically an anabolic hormone. Uh, we think about it at, as anabolic hormone, but also it's, it has a vital role in driving all nutrients, not just glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids inside the cells, so the cells can utilize them. And uh, it kind of moves the glucose through glycolysis, so it can be further burnt into ATP and energy product production. And uh, we also have a system of anti-insulin hormones. We call them the counter-regulatory hormones. And these would be glucagon, growth hormone, cortisol, and epinephrine. They do the exact opposite. So their job is to function in the absence of fuel. They kick in, they increase blood glucose, they make, uh, they kind of create a homeostasis uh, with insulin in order to keep fuel available in the circulation. But if these also get over uh, secreted, so for example, if you have too much cortisol for a very long time, this by itself can promote uh, adipocyte formation, uh, lipid accumulation, obesity, uh, diabetes on the long term. So it's all about balance. Before we speak about uh, hyperinsulinemia, I want to speak about insulin deficiency and the history of it. Uh, this is a child that had type 1 diabetes, and it's among the first cases that were treated of insulin with insulin and recovered. Before that, children would just die with type 1 diabetes because it has vital functions in growth, uh, in maintenance, uh, in cell proliferation. And we already know that if insulin receptor is absent in mice, they just don't survive. So it is certainly a vital hormone. And ever since uh, insulin's discovery, since 1923, much work has been done to understand its functions until we also further understood how it works in type 2 diabetes, and many Nobel Prizes were granted to scientists for their work on insulin. But how about insulin excess? So this is like the, end, the other end of the spectrum, uh, which is what we call hyperinsulinemia. This also is problematic because it is associated with uh, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, obesity, cancer, uh, chronic inflammation, hypertension, atherosclerosis. And I will show that the evidence suggests that it's not just an association. It can actually be a causal uh, factor in these diseases. 
what's hyperinsulinemia anyway, on, uh, at least by like medical textbooks and most medical references, you're gonna see a fasting insulin of less than 25 milliunits per liter is what's considered to be normal, even though some studies suggest that lower level can be more beneficial, but not lower than two. Um, other studies also looked at postprandial insulin and the importance of its return to the, uh, uh, to the baseline, which is less than 25 after two to three hours of a meal ingestion or glucose load. And here we're looking at a number, a big number of studies that looked about, looked at the correlation between hyperinsulinemia and various conditions like central obesity, diabetes, renal failure, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, sleep apnea, you can name it, metabolic syndrome, all of these chronic diseases. That in the study populations, uh, most, of the most of the study population actually in those studies had hyperinsulinemia versus the studies that did not show hyperinsulinemia are actually rather rare. So, and that's pretty significant. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the connection to metabolic syndrome. And the criteria to diagnose metabolic syndrome has been evolving through the history of uh, research. It had been focused more on the waist circumference on triglyceride levels if elevated, LDL, HDL, cholesterol, uh, BMI, all of these factors. But now we're seeing that uh, uh, organizations like World Health Organization and a European Group for Study of Insulin Resistance have actually added insulin resistance and its related issues like hyperinsulinemia and peritfastic glucose as uh, a criteria for the diagnosis, as one of the crit criteria for the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, if not to be a necessary criteria for its diagnosis. Uh, but still not all organizations would consider that. As a matter of fact, in some of the studies that report uh, hypertriglyceridemia, for example, uh, the study pop population, 95% of it would have hyperinsulinemia. So, and that's, that says something about it. What causes hyperinsulinemia in general? That's a critical question, and I'm gonna uh, spend some time explaining uh, those factors. Uh, factors can be quite direct that uh, involve insulin administration, of course, uh, insulin secretagogues like sul sulfonylureas, uh, insulinomas, uh, which are tumors in the pancreas that oversecrete insulin. Uh, we have congenital hyperinsulinism or autoimmunity to insulin or the insulin receptor where we see the insulin like uh, bound to, the anti to its antibodies in the circulation which delays its clearance. Uh, in addition to, ha to that, we have severe liver disease and liver congestion with heart disease. Uh, all of that can uh, lead to reduced insulin clearance, and this would lead to hyperinsulinemia uh, and may or not lead to hypoglycemia, depending on how, how strong the compensatory insulin secretion is. And then we have conditions that are rather associated because they're chronic. We like to call them associated with hyperinsulinemia. And these would be obesity, uh, steroid administration, like glucocorticoids, because there's a counter-regulatory hormones, they induce insulin resistance, uh, drive insulin secretion, acromegaly, uh, Cushing syndrome, insulin receptor mutations, which are rare, of course, and uh, uh, last but not least, type 2 diabetes. And of course, obesity and type 2 diabetes are the uh, most pro prevalent causes or uh, uh, related factors to hyperinsulinemia. What are the consequences of hyperinsulinemia? Let's study the pattern and the relationship with obesity and diabetes. So we see here in normal uh, uh, and uh, lean individuals, insulin levels are high, these are fasting insulin levels, and then they start rising uh, with obesity, impaired obesity, uh, non-incident 
dependent uh, diabetes, and in later stages, it's even uh, higher. Uh, so insulin definitely correlates, positively correlates with body weight and diabetes status. And if we look at the natural history of diabetes, untreated diabetes, how does it go? You're gonna see interestingly that insulin in, in some studies come before impaired glucose tolerance um, by 25 years in some studies or 22 years, and this had been consistent. So uh, despite that, um, there is still resistance by physician to test insulin levels. So uh, a lot of scientists now are saying that testing insulin is important if body, uh, excessive body weight is there, if other risk factors are there, because it is a very strong predictor of type 2 diabetes. As we can see here, insulin level would rise, correlates with insulin resistance, and at the peak, this is when we start seeing impaired uh, fasting glucose, and then at diabetes, at the uh, exact uh, diagnosis of diabetes, when beta cell, cell failure occurs, this is when hyperglycemia occurs. So in diabetes and insulin resistance, the first event is hyperinsulinemia. And of course, the prevalence of diabetes in the USA and in the world, as a matter of fact, is very high and had been rising since the 1980s through 2010, and now it's even uh, higher. So here we have 22 million people with diabetes. Uh, it has um, uh, dramatic complications that affect quality of life in addition to the costs that come with it. So its prevention is really very important for the well-being of populations. And hyperinsulinemia isn't just about diabetes. It's also about heart disease, which actually we know that cardiovascular events and complications are the main complications that come with uh, diabetes. Uh, so we're looking here at a study that looked at risk uh, of uh, cardiovascular event, new cardiovascular events in heart disease people. And we're looking here at multiple risk factors like hypertension, age, smoking, everything, many factors are correlated, of course, but with analysis, they revealed that insulin of more than 10 units uh, per ml uh, leads to a relative risk increase by 1, 1.7, which is like uh, a 70% increase in relative risk. And they did further analysis in this population. What they did is they took these, this population, they split them into two, diabetic and non-diabetic, and guess what happened to the relative risk here, or the odds ratio of having cardiovascular event? Here's the log insulin, and here we see that odds ratio is 6.7 for all patients, even not diabetic, and for diabetic, it's for uh, non-diabetic patients, it's uh, 4.9. So that said, hyperinsulinemia is a very, very strong risk for cardiovascular events in the absence of hyperglycemia. And that is very important, especially that these numbers statistically um, imply kind of, or suggest a causative relationship. Because in the world of epidemiology, uh, a relative risk or odds ratio of six and four, this is very high. This is like 600% increase in the risk. In addition to that, uh, hyperinsulinemia is also a risk factor for many neurological disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. Um, you can watch my AHS 16 presentation on Alzheimer's disease, and I have uh, focused most of that talk on the role of insulin and insulin resistance in Alzheimer's disease. And for that, you know, we talk about obesity being associated with hyperinsulinemia. We still Scientists kind of are trying to figure out what is the first event that triggers hyperinsulinemia. And for that, various research models have been developed uh, to study uh, where the problem starts. And the classical model of uh, obesity is that it goes from obesity to insulin resistance, and from there, we go to a compensatory increase in insulin secretion. So your cells are not accepting insulin. The pancreas would compensate by secreting more insulin. And how do we 
test that in the lab. We give, for example, mice um, uh, caloric dense diet or high fat diets. They gain a lot of weight. And as we study their adipose tissue biology, we see that increased inflammatory cytokines happen with weight gain. And this would invite uh, and tell the macrophages surrounding the adipocytes to secrete more cytokines. Not only that, they would invite more uh, immune cells from the circulation. This will drive more inflammation. And we know that inflammatory factors uh, disrupt insulin signaling. That big pathway I just showed, uh, it gets disrupted when inflammation is there. So this is the model. We have excessive calorie intake, obesity, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia. But does it go the other way around? So can we say that insulin leads to obesity, for example? And there's a group of researchers that have been doing a significant uh, amount of work in that direction. So here, for example, they, they suggest that insulin level goes up and uh, with that adiposity goes up, and later glycemia or hyperglycemia occur uh, with further insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. And uh, with that, if we start with a certain number of overweight people, like 1,900 million, uh, some will go to prediabetes, and few, uh, not few, uh, less than those will go to type 2 diabetes. So the insulin obesity model is gaining more attraction uh, now because um, evidence suggests that moder moderate uh, uh, reduction in insulin levels in obese people can help in weight loss. And uh, weight gain and insulin resistance, so, so this is kind of the evidence for this model, that, that weight gain and insulin resistance uh, can occur following insulin administration in type 1 diabetes. If excessive insulin is administered to these people, they eventually will become insulin resistant and obese. So here we know that increased insulin is what started to issue. People with insulinoma or increased insulin secretion because of tumors uh, also uh, can develop insulin resistant and obesity because of that. And there has been very neat uh, animal work, animal like mouse models, uh, that insert genetically modify the mouse and insert the human insulin gene into the mouse. And if this insulin gene is simply overexpressed, it will lead these mice to be more insulin resistant and more uh, obese compared to the control mice that didn't have an overactivation of this gene. So further evidence that the problem can start with hyperinsulinemia. And insulin administration by itself in mice induces weight gain despite their caloric restriction. That means it's not all about caloric restriction. Excess insulin can actually oppose uh, the, uh, uh, the attempt to lose weight. Addition to that, hyperinsulinemia occurs before weight gain in mice that are prone to obesity, like these uh, uh, mice are known to be prone to obesity and uh, diabetes, like C57 black 6 mice and leptin deficient mice, uh, it was shown that hyperinsulinemia comes before their weight gain. Hyperinsulinemia also leads to insulin resistance in Drosophila, and that's because, just like many hormones, if you overexpose the cells to them, these cells get desensitized. And it's true for so many hormones, for so many medications. So this is like the kind of the summary of the insulin obesity models. We know that hyperinsulinemia uh, in observational study is strongly correlated with not just obesity, but with many other diseases. And we have preclinical evidence like on animals that would support that. And then we have clinical evidence, some studies on clinical evidence that would suggest this true. And we have one or two studies that would kind of uh, don't agree with that, that say the reduction of calories kind of matter more than, you know, the focus on hyperinsulinemia. And that was the insulin obesity model, and this had led some scientists to think maybe it's carbohydrates 
that are driving the insulin and therefore the obesity. And um, um, so for the conventional model, as I said, uh, uh, the scope of the disease is that overeating would lead uh, to and along with reduced energy expenditure and reduced uh, physical activity would lead to uh, increased body weight, and this would lead to increased fat storage, and as I said, then insulin resistance, then hyperinsulinemia, and then all the diseases. Uh, but the carbohydrate insulin obesity model says that carbohydrate consumption would lead to overeating, so as a major, uh, as a major cause of overeating, and because insulin is an anabolic hormone, this would increase fat storage and then this will drive the rest of the problems uh, with, that come with hyperinsulinemia and obesity, all right? But uh, this hasn't, gained, hasn't yet gained much acceptance in the scientific com community, and I will present the pro, uh, the, the for and the against arguments for this model, because it's rather uh, uh, new. So the evidence uh, for is that um, rodents on high versus low glycemic index uh, diet develop hyperinsulinemia before uh, weight gain. So <coughs> high glycemic load will, see, will lead uh, hypothetically to more insulin and then this will lead to weight gain. Uh, also people who have uh, certain like variants in their insulin receptor promoters that would typically lead to increased insulin secretion, these people are more prone to uh, obesity during adolescence, so early in life. Um, there are also two trials, the Diogenes and the direct clinical trials, which found greater weight loss on low versus high glycemic load diet. And we also have that carbohydrate restriction was superior to fat restriction in reducing dyslipidemia in multiple studies, especially actually hypertriglyceridemia. What's the evidence against? We have actually a well-designed clinical trial, the diet fits, which uh, reported no significant differences in weight loss between participants on low carbohydrate versus high fat, uh, uh, sorry, low carbohydrate versus low fat diet over a 12 month intervention. And the baseline insulin it did not seem to predict the degree of weight loss. So that's kind of the evidence uh, against. Uh, typically, as I have went through so many studies, I've seen that uh, um, on low carbohydrate diets, the uh, initial weight loss is faster than the low fat diet, but eventually uh, the rate will level off and after a long period of intervention, you're gonna see that they, um, you know, the rate of weight loss is the same. Uh, and that's likely because insulin is not the only factor that affects uh, uh, anabolism and catabolism inside the cells. Um, because at the end of the day, the fate of fuels inside the cell would depend on ATP sensors, like molecule whose, molecules whose job is to sense how much ATP and energy is inside the cells. While this is affected by insulin, it can be affected by so many other things. And that's why insulin is not the only player. It is, uh, it is definitely a strong contributor to the complications of diabetes and obesity, but certainly not the only one. And in, it appears that so far, most studies would indicate that caloric restriction tends to be the winner, at least in terms of body weight. So in conclusion, hyperinsulinemia is a strong risk factor for multiple chronic diseases with many studies pointing to a causal uh, relationship, as I showed. Uh, screening for insulin levels must become a routine in the clinical uh, practice for early intervention. We can capture these diseases way before we have to give any medication. And we have very successful intervention in reducing insulin. Uh, one is weight loss. Weight loss on any diet would be expected to reduce body weight, reduce insulin, and this would be beneficial. And fasting, of course, 
uh, low carbohydrate diets are of course the most effective in reducing insulin. That is because uh, insulin is the carbohydrates or glucose is the strongest uh, secretagogue. And of course, exercise and sleep are important. Uh, but uh, I didn't talk much about also glycemic load and the glycemic index. Uh, so if carbohydrates are gonna be ingested, certainly simple carbohydrates like sugars, uh, refined flours, all of that, these are risk factors for diabetes by themselves, independent of anything. So definitely simple carbohydrates. Uh, if we're gonna blame carbohydrates, uh, a big part of the problem would be simple, simple carbohydrates. While complex carbohydrates, uh, you know, in many, at least observational uh, studies would show that people can be healthy without diabetes while eating those. Um, so, yep, thank you.